Now we're going to talk about the small intestine and we'll look at, at its gross anatomy first. It's the major organ of digestion and absorption. Most absorption will take place in the small intestine. It's about two to four meters long and it goes from the pyloric sphincter to the ileocecal valve. It has three parts, the duodenum, which is retroperitoneal and the shortest part, followed by the jejunum and ileum, which is attached to a mesentery. Here we can see parts of the small intestine, the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. The duodenum is this short part here attached to the stomach, and the jejunum and ileum is in here. The ileum also is going to meet up with the first part of the large intestine, the cecum, and that's where we'll find the ileocecal valve. The duodenum, duodenum again, is the curved shortest part of the small intestine, and it curves around the head of the pancreas about 25 centimeters in length. It accepts both the bile duct and the main pancreatic duct at the hepatopancreatic ampulla, and they enter the duodenum at the major duodenum papilla, and that entry is controlled by a sphincter called the hepatopancreatic sphincter. So here is the pancreas in yellow, and we have the main pancreatic duct here, common bile duct here, and they're meeting at the hepatopancreatic ampulla and sphincter. So they're meeting right here, hepatic pancreatic ampulla and sphincter. The duodenum is this piece of the small intestine wrapped around the head of the pancreas, and we can see the major duodenum papilla here, where the secretions from the gallbladder or the liver and the pancreas could empty into the small intestine. So again, the main pancreatic duct and the common bile duct meet at the hepatopancreatic ampulla and they are allowed to enter the small intestine at the duodenum via the major duodenum papilla, and that entry is controlled by the hepatopancreatic sphincter. The jejunum and the ileum are the next two parts of the small intestine. The jejunum extends from the duodenum to the ileum, and then the ileum extends from the jejunum all the way to the ileocecal valve, which meets the cecum, the first part of the large intestine. The vagus nerve or the parasympathetic nervous system fiber and the sympathetics from the thoracic splanchic nerves, they're all going to be able to serve the small intestine. So there is a nerve supply to the small intestine so we can consider it innervated. The superior mesenteric artery would bring blood supply to the small intestine and the veins that would carry nutrient-rich blood away from the small intestine include the superior mesenteric veins that lead into the hepatic portal veins and that they lead to the liver. We do this so that the blood that is carrying nutrient-rich material passes through a detoxifying agent, the liver, and we're able to look at that blood to make sure there's no pathogens or dangerous substance, substances in it before it enters into regular circulation. There are some structural modifications we really want to note for the small intestine. And the purpose of all of these structural modifications we're about to look at is to increase surface area, to increase the amount of area through which we can absorb nutrients. We find that we absorb the most nutrients in the proximal part of the small intestine or in that duodenum. But we still see that these circular folds, villi, the microvilli, they're present throughout the small intestine. The circular folds are also known as plique circularis. So circular folds or plique circularis are permanent folds of the mucosa and they're about one centimeter deep and they're gonna force chyme to slowly spiral through the lumen. It gives more surface area for nutrient absorption and also aids the movement of that chyme. The villi are extensions of the mucosa and within each villi is a capillary bed, a capillary bed and a lacteal, because most biological molecules will be absorbed in the small intestine into the blood, but lipids are absorbed into a lymphatic vessel, specifically a lacteal, which is a specialized capillary for absorption. And then the microvilli are also known as a brush border. The microvilli are located on the enteric cells themselves. So the microvilli are extensions of the plasma membrane of enteric cells. They do contain enzymes for carbohydrate and protein digestion. So if an enzyme is called a brush border enzyme, it is located in the microvilli of the small intestine. So we can see here the plique circularis or circular folds, the villi, and we're gonna take a closer look at the villi in order to see the microvilli on the enteric cells. 
So these bigger folds here that extend throughout the mucosa, those are these circular folds. On one of these circular folds, you have these tiny projections. These mucosal projections are villi. And if we blew up one of those villi, so here's a villus, we would see that on the villus are individual cells. So all of these are individual cells. Inside the villus is a green lacteal. So here's our green lacteal and a capillary bed. So we have a capillary bed and a lacteal that can absorb all biological molecules within each villus. And we have cells wrapped around that villus or that projection of the mucosa. And then if we were to look at one of those cells individually, we would see that it also has projections. And these projections are a part of its cell membrane. These projections are the microvilli, and the microvilli are also known as the brush border. So again, circular folds or plique circularis are permanent folds of mucosa and submucosa. Villi are folds or projections of the mucosa. Within each villus is a lacteal and a capillary bed for absorption. Absorption must occur through the enteric cells which line each villus, and each enteric cell has its own brush border, which is microvilli or cell membrane projections. Here is another example of a villus. We can also see that the enteric cells have goblet cells or mucus secreting cellular glands within them. Here you can see mucus granules on top of the microvilli. So this is cell membrane that we're seeing in red. So cell membrane of an enteric cell. So we're looking at the brush border and on top of this brush border is not only mucus and its granules, but mixed in there and kind of held in place by those mucus granules would be those brush border enzymes. So we're just establishing the structure of the small intestine. We're looking at what makes it up, the structural modifications, increased surface area for absorption, but we saw with the microvilli they're also holding enzymes in place, which are important for chemical digestion. There's also intestinal crypts in the small intestine, and the intestinal crypts contain stem cells that renew the epithelium every two to four days. And that intestinal crypt epithelium gets renews, renewed sorry, because most secretory cells that produce intestinal juice are located there. They contain the enteroendocrine cells, which produce the enterogastrones, but also some intraepithelial lymphocytes, which release cytokines that kill any infected cells, PANIF cells, which secrete antimicrobial agents, defensins, lysosomes. A lot of the mucosal secretions associated with the immune system are secreted by these intraepithelial lymphocytes and PANIF cells. But we also have those stem cells that are producing the crypt cells themselves and then allowing its renewal. A homeostatic imbalance we just want to mention, though, is the fact that intestinal cells divide very quickly. And chemotherapy, which is a treatment for many types of cancers, is supposed to target rapidly dividing cells. That's why chemotherapy oftentimes not only kills cancer cells, but can affect blood cells and also the GI tract, specifically the enteric cells of the small intestine. So it kills those rapidly dividing GI tract epithelium, and that's why nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea are common symptoms of treatments with chemotherapy, is because of the effects it's having on that dividing GI tract epithelium. We want to remind everyone about Peyer's patches mentioned in our immune chapter. The mucosa of the GI tract, specifically the small intestine, contains Peyer's patches. And these contain germinal centers with B cells that can make immunoglobulins. They could make IgA, which was our mucosal dimer of an antibody. And they may protrude into the submucosa, but we can find Peyer's patches in the mucosa. The B lymphocytes are actually able to leave the intestine, enter the blood, protect the rest of the intestinal wall, and, and protect that lamina propria with their IgA. There's also duodenal or Brunner's glands of the duodenum, which secrete an alkaline mucus and are able to neutralize that acidic chyme that gets dumped from the stomach into that first part of the small intestine. So intestinal juice is secreted daily, about one to two liters, and it's in response to stretch or irritation of the mucosa. So it's in response to not only distension, but also chemicals. The intestinal juice is slightly alkaline, 
in order to neutralize acidic chyme. It's going to be pretty isotonic with blood plasma, so pretty similar in ionic composition, but it's mainly going to have water. It's going to be largely water-rich type of mucus secreted by the intestinal juice. It's enzyme poor. Most of the enzymes are not going to be in the intestinal juice. Instead, they're going to be bound to the brush border. So the enzymes of the small intestine are only in the brush border. They're going to be stuck in those mucus granules, but they're not really going to be mixing with the intestinal juice. So really the intestinal juice is for the neutralization of acidic chyme and facilitating transport and absorption of nutrients through the small intestine. Next, we're going to move into our accessory organs, especially the liver and gallbladder, which are very important and really closely associated with the small intestine, specifically the duodenum. The liver has many functions. We've talked about it before. We'll talk about it more. Some of those functions are detoxifying, but its only digestive function is to create bile. The liver produces bile. Bile is a fat emulsifier. It helps break down large globules of fat into smaller globules of fat so that it's easier for lipase, which is a fat digesting enzyme, to act upon. But it's important to know the liver produces bile. Whereas the gallbladder, its chief function is to take that bile from the liver and store it. So the chief function of the gallbladder is the storage of bile. So let's just simplify that real quick. The liver produces bile. The gallbladder is going to store bile. The liver is the largest gland in the body. It has four lobes. You've probably seen the right and left one before because the cauda and quadrate are going to be posterior to the right and left. The falciform ligament separates the right and left lobes of the liver, and we're going to see it also suspends the liver to an extent from the diaphragm, especially from that anterior abdominal wall. There's also a round ligament. It's a remnant of the fetal umbilical vein. We find this along the free edge of the falciform ligament. So here we have the right lobe of the liver, the left lobe of the liver, we also have the caudate lobe of the liver in the back and the quadrate lobe of the liver in the back. And then this little sac right here on the posterior side of the liver is the gallbladder. So again, the liver produces bile, the gallbladder stores it. The lesser omentum anchors the liver to the stomach. We saw it when we were talking about the gross anatomy of the stomach. The hepatic artery and vein enter at a porta hepatis to the liver, and the bile ducts that are also associated with the liver contain a common hepatic duct, a cystic duct, and a bile duct. Now, the bile ducts we'll look at in an upcoming slide so we can see exactly which ones are where. But the common hepatic duct leaves the liver. There's a left and right duct to the liver. They combine to form the common hepatic duct, and that leaves the liver. The common hepatic duct then joins up with the cystic duct, which is coming from the gallbladder, to form the common bile duct, or sometimes just called the bile duct. So you see bile duct here formed by the union of the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct. So let's point those out. So we have the left and right hepatic ducts. They come together to form the common hepatic duct. And then that's from the liver. Over here we have our gallbladder. The gallbladder has a cystic duct, and when the common bile duct needs to be formed, it's formed by the common hepatic duct and the cystic duct coming together. So here is our common bile duct, which goes to the hepatopancreatic ampulla and sphincter, along with that pancreatic duct. So, the cystic duct and the common hepatic duct combine to form the bile duct. The cystic duct comes from the gallbladder. The common hepatic duct comes from the liver. We want to look at liver lobules as well, which are hexagonal shaped structures. They're the functional unit of the liver. They are composed of liver cells, so hepatocytes. And they filter and process nutrient-rich blood, which makes sense because they're detoxifying in function. So, so far, the liver functions important to the digestive system are detoxification of nutrient-rich blood that leaves the digestive system and the production of bile. Each 
hexagonal structure, or liver lobule, composed of hepatocytes, has a central vein along its longitudinal axis. So here we can see its central vein. We can see how it's hexagonal in structure. It has six sides. There is connective tissue septums or areas that separate the lobules. And over here we can see that there's many lobules that make up the entire liver. There's a portal triad at each corner of a lobule, and each portal triad has an artery, a hepatic artery, a vein called hepatic portal vein, and it has a bile duct. The bile duct is going to be connected to a network of smaller ducts called canaliculi, and the bile duct is connected to canaliculi called bile canaliculi. And so it's receiving bile from these canaliculi, and that bile is then going from the liver to the gallbladder. The hepatic artery is supplying oxygen to the liver, and the hepatic portal vein is bringing nutrient-rich blood in order for that to be filtered out, and we're going to be looking for pathogens or anything dangerous in it. We're going to try to detoxify it. The liver sinusoids are leaky capillaries, so they're between the hepatic plates, but liver sinusoids are small capillary beds that have really big holes in them. They have big fenestrations, they have large pores, big intercellular clefts, so this allows macrophages, cells, to actually leave the capillaries, go into tissue, and look at the blood, or vice versa. So we're actually able to remove debris, old red blood cells, or bacterial toxins from blood that's coming from the digestive system. This makes sure that blood is purified before it reaches general circulation. So here is a microscopic anatomy of the liver. We're looking at one liver lobule. So here's where the central vein would be. We can see the central vein would branch out to each side of the hexagonal shaped lobule. At the sides of the hexagonal shaped lobule, we have the portal triad. So we have a bile duct, we have a portal vein, and we have a hepatic artery. We can also see that the portal veins are connected to these networks of ducts that are smaller than the bile duct itself, and they're called bile canaliculi. So furthermore, with that microscopic anatomy of the liver, the liver cells know they're hepatocytes. They arrange themselves in plates that form liver, lo liver lobules. And those liver lobules contain portal triads on their hexagonal sides. The hepatocytes themselves have a lot of rough and smooth ER. They have a Golgi apparatus, peroxisomes, mitochondria. So they have everything they need to not only process bloodborne nutrients, but to store fat-soluble vitamins, use that to make bile, perform detoxification. And they produce about 900 milliliters of that bile per day. The liver is also regenerative. It has a regenerative capacity. It can re restore itself to full size in about 6 to 12 months after 80% removal. So injury to the hepatocytes actually causes the release of growth factors, which act on the endothelial cells that we find located in the liver and causes cell proliferation. Hepatitis is inflammation of the liver, usually due to a viral infection. Drug toxicity or wild mushroom poisoning can also cause hep hepatitis. Cirrhosis is long-term hepatitis or progressive chronic inflammation of the liver. It can result again from that chronic hepatitis, but also commonly from alcoholism. Cirrhosis is characterized by fatty or fibrous deposits building up on the liver, which stresses out the vascularization of the, li of the liver, causing portal hypertension. So when someone suffers from cirrhosis, it's suggested usually for them to get a liver transplant, which is very successful, but livers are scarce. We're next we're going to look at bile and what it's made up of. It is yellow and green in color, a little darker than probably what you would expect. It's alkaline in chemical composition, so it's going to have a higher pH than the acid of the stomach. It contains bile salts and bilirubin, so it contains these bile salts and a pigment Bilirubin is a breakdown product from heme, and bile salts are cholesterol derivatives. So we have cholesterol derivatives that are going to help us break down fat. So the bile salts function in emulsification, the fat breakdown process or pretreatment. It allows for fat to be absorbed easier. And then bilirubin is a pigment formed from heme that is going to just kind of hitch a ride with the bile salts. It also helps suspend them in a fluid, but it's going to be able to break down bacteria in the intestine, be broken down, sorry, in the intestines to stercobilin by bacteria. Mainly it's going to be broken down by bacteria in the 
large intestine to stercobilin. And it's usually recycled, but some of it does end up in your feces, and that's the reason that your feces is brown, because of the pigment stercobilin. So bilirubin is kind of yellow-green, stercobilin is kind of brown. Cholesterol, triglycerides, phospholipids, and electrolytes may also be found in bile. So the enterohepatic circulation is looking at the recycling of bile. Bile salts are 100% recycled. They go from the gallbladder to the duodenum via the cystic duct, which combines to become the common bile duct as it combines with the ducts from the liver. It's reabsorbed in the ileum, and the ileum is that last part of the small intestine, and it travels via the hepatic portal system back to the liver and gets secreted back into the bile that the liver makes anyways. So bile salts are 100% recycled. The gallbladder itself we've seen in a couple of images. It's usually green in color on models, but actually it's about the same color as the liver. It's very thin walled and its function is to store bile. It also concentrates that bile by absorbing some of the water and ions that are initially in the bile that is distributed to the gallbladder. It's a muscular sac, so it does have some contractile function. And muscular contractions are able to release bile via the cystic duct, and it then flows from the cystic duct into the common bile duct. You can't have too much cholesterol in your gallbladder, so too few bile salts and mainly just cholesterol derivative can lead to the development of biliary colliculi, or gallstones. And these can get stuck in the cystic duct, so they can prevent bile from leaving the gallbladder. So it could cause obstructive jaundice as bile leaks from the liver into nearby tissue. So the gallbladder contracting against these sharp crystals is gonna be very painful. So not only could you have jaundice occur, we could have pain on top of this. And luckily, gallstones can really be easily treated with drugs or ultrasound vibrations, which is a common treatment, or lithotripsy. Laser vaporization, and then rarely surgery nowadays, but surgery could be used in order to get rid of gallstones. Lithotripsy is a non-invasive procedure that uses sound vibrations to break apart these colliculi. And that is it for part B of our digestive system. Make sure you review the small intestine and the stomach and that you're familiar with what produces bile and what stores bile.